Hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you are listening to the Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm chatting with Ronnie Higgins. Ronnie is the director of content marketing at Hopin, an events platform that offers a virtual venue with multiple interactive areas that are optimized for connecting and engaging. This conversation was so fun. We explored deep topics right at the beginning, such as the pros and cons of questioning everything, always asking why, including questioning oneself, imposter syndrome, a very common topic, and how to actually get over it, uh, walking through an example from Ronnie's life, why most companies who say they're building media companies actually aren't, and what a media company actually looks like, and importantly, the most underrated aspects of New Orleans. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Ronnie Higgins. So I didn't prep you at all for the conversation, I don't think, uh, but we can talk about, uh, actually, you touched on uh, music promoter. So I want to talk about your background and how that led you to this point, some content opinions, and then maybe you can talk a little bit about Hopin and how you guys approach content. It doesn't have to be spokesperson level, but yeah. And you can right. shoot back at me. You can, you know, yeah, yeah. ask me questions, argue, whatever you want to do too. No, no, and- those are the best. Those are the best podcasts, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, like the Q and a stuff tends to just be it's, it's the same problem in events. People think that they could just like get a panel together of names and it's just going to equal great content when truly what you need to do is have a moderator who creates the engagement that then just radiates out from it. Uh, and so my favorite podcasts are the ones where it's more of a engaged conversation than just, someone going on and on about their own you know experiences and beliefs or whatever i did a panel a couple a couple of years ago and uh it, the moderator was very good but like everybody every other panelist was sort of just doing the oh stock answer i agree with you very friendly thing so i was like all right fuck it i'm gonna <laughs> give my I, I wasn't being a devil's advocate just to do it but i was like all right let's just say what i actually think here yeah. and I, I think it created a little bit more like a uh, tension and also excitement and then I got off and one of the other guys on the panel was like, oh, that was really cool that you were like playing devil's advocate to make it exciting. I was like, no, this is just talking, like just saying yeah. what I think. Yeah. Um, I, in my life, have been worried sometimes that I can be too abrasive because I'll bring up uncomfortable things about something or I, you know, my it took my wife a while to get used to this of like, I will bring up things that might show how something go can go wrong or how like to reframe things in a way that change the dynamics. Like just after before this had a call about something and I said, all right, well, we're, we're talking about a multiple different pieces of like criteria. How about I simplify it into what matters by saying uh, like, here's a thought experiment. Let's pretend instead of having to choose like people from the company to be like the authors of content, like let's just imagine we hire someone Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to mask this example. So I don't give too much of it, but, and that then like led to focusing on what really mattered about that decision because we were trying to think of like 10 different things. And I simplified it to the three things that mattered and it caused some friction at, at the beginning because everyone was like well we would do that and i'm like there's a reason i said it's a thought experiment like let's use this as the construct to simplify the thing and i don't know like i tend to like it's how my thinking has shaped it's how i see i would say i would be a shit marketer if i hadn't been unfiltered in questioning why why that uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure if you asked my parents about me, like growing up, I was probably a pain in the ass. Like I grew up Catholic. I remember going to confirmation in high school and I asked about some, I questioned some things that were being taught. And one of the things I, I, I can't remember what I was questioning, but I said, you know, growing up, we're all told if we're not good, Santa is not going to bring you presents. Yet all around me were people who were like, because I was bullied in elementary school that changed in high school. 
because I found myself, I think. But uh, I saw people who bullied me who would talk about things after Christmas about their, you know, getting the GI Joe aircraft carrier where I didn't get that. And I'm like, that's bullshit. So people are, we're telling kids this so that they behave. And I asked, do you think that there's parts of the, you know, scripture that are supposed to do that? And well, <laughs> I don't remember how it played out in the confirmation courses, but or classes, but shortly after that, my mom had to have a talk with me of like, it's good that you're thinking that way. And it's good that you're like questioning the world around you, but there's a time and place for it. And, but if I think about that tenacity in me to question even something like that, like I would not be where I am today in my career because I never took everything for granted. I never looked at data and said, Oh, so that just means the post was great. No, I need to know why. Mm -hmm. Or why did that thing, you know, really like I didn't question only the things that were broken or things that like my boss or managers cared about. I scrutinized everything so I'd always have the answers and understand the world around me of what I was working with and what was happening. And so now forgetting how we got to that, but I think just asking questions and being able to like be comfortable being a thorn in someone's side. Do you, when, so like, this is interesting. I resonate with this so much. Uh, I've had a rebellious streak since I was a little kid. Like I picked the opposite sports team that my dad liked just because I wanted to be different. I also uh, grew up Catholic and went to confirmation and all that stuff. And I remember fifth, sixth, seventh grade, I started listening to George Carlin, <laughs> who became one of my intellectual heroes. So I became that person as well for like many of the institutions and education and whatnot. But also with myself, like I find like I always scrutinize every li like little decision and kind of overthink things. But there's part of me that wishes sometimes, you know, the ignorance is bliss thing that I could just go, all right, here's the common assumptions and the best practices. And here's the path that I could take. Let's just do it as opposed to like, you know, sitting there kind of like stewing on every little thing. Have you gone through that um, mental fight with yourself yeah. too? So. You're right. Like when you are, when you have that rebellious streak and you have that, that question everything, it's not a, and it's a misconception, I think, to the people who don't do that, that you're only questioning. I mean, there are narcissists and I don't believe we're narcissists that question everything, but don't question themselves. But when you really are like questioning everything, you tend to also look introspectively. And I had that where I went from before Eventbrite was working at a company called Intrax. This is where I had basically landed in the Bay Area after the 2008 crash. I didn't have a job. I had worked at this company for a brief moment after Hurricane Katrina. I reached out to people, said, I need a job, got anything. They gave me an office job. I turned that into a video marketing job, which then turned into my, my first content role. And the, the prowess of marketing there was not what it is in SaaS, B2B SaaS marketing mm. of you need to be like the best, the best to like actually like succeed here. And so going from there to Eventbrite made that question everything go fully internal. Mm. And when people talk about imposter syndrome, I had a monster inside of me of an imposter that every, the, one of the first questions I got asked when I got, after I accepted the role was like, Oh, where are you coming from? Was like someone in sales. And I said, what do you mean by that question? And they're like, Oh, well, what university are you coming from? Like Facebook or something? I'm like, uh, is this company called Intrax? And they're like, Oh, pharmaceuticals. No, it's a cultural exchange. Never mind. Like, I started to like realize I was like not like the rest of everyone else and started mm -hmm. to question myself, even though I had worked my butt off to like become a good communicator, good storyteller. I just suddenly was like questioning everything. And it took a lot of therapy, a lot of co uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of, I picked up a meditation habit that I've now been meditating for over three and a half a little over three and a half years every day. Nice. And it took a lot of that to sort of 
get to the point that you were saying of being able to just let something go and see where it goes and not have to question and overthink something and embrace this like faith of like, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. It's, it's crazy. This is a, an amazing conversation. Uh, it's, it's deep to start, um, but I'm happy for that. We, we had a conversation two weeks ago with the co-founders um, with our trajectories into content marketing. And there was like three things in common. One was that we had mentors that kind of helped us like, you know, push ourselves and believed in us more than maybe we did. Um, the other thing, well, we kind of like followed similar paths, uh, kind of stumbling our way in here. And then the last one was we were all very insecure in ourselves early in our career uh, to the point where David and I talked about it. Like up until a couple of years ago, I thought I was going to get fired every day. <laughs> like it was just like always like, I'm like when's the other shoe going to drop? When are they going to like find me out? You know? And then now I don't feel like that, which is great. But there was something that came up, which is um, it's like when somebody gets really rich and then they tell you money doesn't make you happy. It's like, well, that's a great vantage point that you can say that from now. But like you got there through this path. So something that I thought is maybe that insecurity and anxiety did give you that push that, you know, you, you, you elevated yourself to a different level that you wouldn't have without that. And you don't want to like carry that chip on your shoulder, like your whole career, your whole life. But like, yeah. maybe there is something to that that pushes you in like maybe a farther direction than, than otherwise. I think there is. And so I've reached the point in my career where I mentor people and there are some people that I've mentored who I witnessed them going through the imposter syndrome. And one of the earliest mistakes I made was thinking that telling them that they're going like what I'd gone through and how it's, it really is all in your head. I had this, belief that telling them would help them see the forest for the trees and just snap out of it and it just didn't happen and I was like oh okay well now what like I thought I had the clue because I had gone through that experience of just go this way not that way and it was through the process after that of helping them find those opportunities to work through it on their own that I started to believe exactly what you're saying is it's I hate to use Star Wars, but it's the thing from The Last Jedi that Yoda says of like failure is a great teacher. Mm. And failure, I mean, as long as you're analyzing those failures, you will always get better. And that's something that I then started to retrospectively look at my four year, four and a half years at Eventbrite, where I went from a fish out of water to scaling the global operation and running it up until the point where I was building an in-house media company and got the cross-functional buy-in to do it. The only thing that stopped me was a pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, but it's only in that retrospective that I saw that going through the like the, the shit and the crap that made me into the person that could deflect, you know, the shit and the crap that came at me when it mattered most, which is like once you reach like a senior level, especially at like a company like Coppin like or any other startup that is pretty much relying on you to do a very important job the it helps you deal with the scrutiny it helps you deal with being under like a microscope from the executive level to where it you've been through that you don't and it's better to go through it back then when i was an individual contributor than to go through it now because if i went through it now let's just say i'd be like a certain ceo that got a 45 page powerpoint written about him uh in why they didn't deserve the job and i would rather mm -hmm. fail at that level of ic than as i move up the ladder in my career because it's i learn the lessons and there's still a lot of failure to be done i'm sure in my career i'm not saying it's all smooth sailing from here but going through it as bad as i did i think definitely shaped me to be more resilient as i mm -hmm. am today 
Yeah, I'm sure like there's positions that you, you know, you probably aren't qualified for in life. And like, you're going to learn that lesson one way or another, if you get in those positions, but it sounds like the process to overcome some of the imposter syndrome and build confidence and, uh, I guess, like stillness in in where you are is to have some sort of an opportunity where you feel maybe overwhelmed, um, enter that wholehearted, you know, and you're going to be a little afraid. You're going to be a little nervous, but like pick off, you know, one thing, uh, get that done, achieve small things and get better every time. Um, And then you look back and you're like, holy shit, I did those things. And then you have some sort of a track record of experience that you can actually objectively say, okay, I'm, I'm probably okay. Yeah. I mean, there's, it's all, also too like when when you're dealing with imposter syndrome you're so hard on yourself that you you tend to be adverse to validation and positive feedback Mm -hmm. and I think that's something that I it took me forever to finally just accept praise and to say like thank you instead of a knee-jerk reaction of explaining why it's you know too kind and why I don't deserve it downplaying it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you invited me to come talk to you. Like that's validation. That's validation that like I might have something to share and someone has seen something in me and that I can share it with others. Cause I'm one of the, I think you could talk to anybody I've managed. I don't, you have that old school, like my shit doesn't stink manager. Like you know, the, the trope of like a boss versus a leader. Mm -hmm. Um, and I tend to want to share my knowledge with other people. I tend to want to, and the more I've been able to do that, the better I've felt about everything I've gone through. And I also realize like, I end up learning, as I said, uh, when I get on calls like this, like I end up saying things that I didn't realize was my knowledge and experience, which then, further like helps me understand myself and where I am and what else I could share. How did you, you mentioned that um, you mentioned briefly that you were into music promoting and you mentioned uh, your career at Eventbrite. How, how did you get to this place where you're the director of content at Hopin? All right. So you got to figure out the, the long story short, because <laughs> if not, this end up being the whole 90 minutes long. Uh, I, it's even further back that like when I was a little kid, I was fascinated with movies and TV shows. I was obsessed with star Wars. Like most other kids were, uh, I, I played with toys late. Like when everyone else around me stopped playing with toys, I was still kind of into it. A lot of that was attributed to my younger brother when I was a little kid, I had a very vivid, imagine, vivid imagination. I was obsessed with like movies and TV shows. My grandfather and I used to go to the dollar cinema like once a week and he'd take me to whatever movie I wanted and not tell my mom if it was R rated. Uh, like I just got obsessed with this idea of storytelling and could constantly come up with stories. Um, fast forward to the, 99 2000 i got into what is now the electronic uh dance music scene but back then was the rave scene and started going to raves i saw like i got swept up in the moment of like what it was like to use music to like just control a massive audience and started to get into djing which then got me connected with promoters then got interested in doing the promotion because I just wanted to go beyond just my one hour slot as a DJ spinning records and wanted to piece together the night for someone. And I, the whole time saw it as like, all right, well, I can't, I don't have a way to make movies. Um, In fact, I to back up in high school was uh, part of our high school. I went to a magnet school. And I helped run uh, with a group, the TV studio, and we would do like commercials and all kind of stuff uh, for the high school. And so I got it. I saw it as an outlet to do the thing that I wanted to do, which was like make movies and tell stories, but through a different medium. And when um, that all kind of came to a head after Katrina, because in Katrina, I lost my whole record collection. I had about three, 400 records. And I moved to San Francisco where I didn't know anybody 
and the whole throwing parties and doing raves kind of ended at that point. Um, I then uh, was finishing. I went to. I wanted to go to college. I went to college late. It was like twenty four when I first went, and I said, "Well, I need to pick a major," and. I didn't know what it was. I just wanted to get a degree because I knew all the jobs I wanted to get said, like, you need a degree. And at the time, someone said, well, when you're DJing, you talk about how you put together a story. Why don't you go, like, make movies and go to film school? And so I went to film school and got a film degree. And that was just this light bulb went on my head of, like, oh, yeah, that was, like, what I've always been obsessed with. And so that then... Turn after I worked in film and television, I have IMDb credits that are mostly all correct. Uh, I did some stuff like script reading for producers, a bunch of other things. And then I lived in New York City when the economy tanked and like uh, all the like financial crisis happened. And I had a choice of staying in New York, bussing tables, barely surviving going back to New Orleans with my tail between my legs or seeing what happens in San Francisco where I had lived for almost a year. And the reason being was a love story. I had met a girl that we kept in touch with. Uh, long story short, there is that girl is now my wife and the mother of my daughter. So good choice on going to San Francisco. Uh, but this all kind of goes back to the movie stuff of taking that film knowledge to then turn a desk job into video marketing. And that happened because we had a new cultural exchange program. And I said, Hey, can I like shoot a video, scratch my itch? I haven't edited anything in a long time. I did it. They let me spend like 10 hours in a week doing it. And I then turned that into a video that the marketing, the CMO and the CEO came to me and said, can you keep doing this? And I was like, sure. And so I became a video marketer. The thing with video marketing was that it was a silo. I was making videos, but there was nothing around it that was helping the video succeed. Mm -hmm. And I started to look into advertising and think of maybe making the switch to agencies. And that was a ruthless world that I didn't want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I then stumbled upon Joe Paluzzi's Get Content, Get Customers. Mm. And when I read that, it clicked. I was like, I want to do content marketing. So this is like 2011, maybe 2012. And I brought the book to the CMO and said, I want to do this here. She read the book, gave it back to me a few weeks later with all kind of notes scribbled in it. And conversations started happening and I got promoted into a content marketing manager and was doing what is traditionally still called content marketing and what has also now branched off into UX content strategy. So I oversaw a web dev team for a little while, helping them create and build multiple sites that all work together. Uh, what was the unifying content strategy across all of them? And then at the same time, helping the different business units uh, develop their content strategy all the way from like sales enablement to like the stuff that were highlighting customer stories. And I hit a wall. There was nothing else I could do there. I knew about this pillar strategy that I was learning from HubSpot and Marketo. And I'm like, we need to do eBooks and all kind of stuff. And I was acted like, or treated like as though I was like overzealous. Mm. And so I started applying for jobs and I applied for Eventbrite. And was stalking the hiring manager on Twitter. And he complained on Twitter that no one submits cover letters. And I replied to him, well, I submitted a cover letter. When should I expect the call? <laughs> Next thing you know is I got a DM saying, what's your phone number? Uh, are you free next Friday for a call? And that was that. I ended up at Eventbrite where I worked under uh, Margaret Jones, who... I was literally learning about content marketing from at Marketo when she was writing all of the content marketing stuff there uh, and her team to build the first B2B content marketing engine. And it was purely demand uh, gen focus. And I learned way more than I ever thought I could ever learn about content marketing. And 
I want to say a few short months. And from there, after everyone left, I was last man standing and they decided to do a reorg of marketing. And they asked me to move into a role where I took over global content marketing. And I was tasked with scaling the regional model that was focused on North America for a global, like how to run content marketing efficiently across the globe. And so all the operational stuff that I learned over the years came in handy and scaled um, right before um, leaving. So, or getting laid off in March of, or April, 2020 uh, from mid 2019 until that point, I had been seeing the writing on the wall that everyone's talking about now of like first party cookies or third party cookies going away and less like ad blockers. I saw the 2016 election and how social media marketing was being misused for propaganda and started to think, wow, people are going to start getting even more savvy about even just content marketing. We need to get smarter. So I started to do some research. I met with, uh, what was then the bureau chief, SF bureau chief of BuzzFeed to get a sense of like how BuzzFeed runs operationally, uh, how they leverage data and data science and how they're thinking about this future. Talked to some other people that I knew that knew the inside of like Wall Street Journal and so forth and Washington Post and had this idea of building a brand newsroom slash what is now like in-house media company. And the idea there was that I saw that we were, we needed, we could build a now, like, I guess like a moat, but like a treat content as a product of the company and not some marketing activity and treat the owned properties like a product where you are optimizing for engagement and keeping people there. So you increase the recency and frequency of those visits through a diverse portfolio of content. And it took a long time for me to get the buy-in. I remember the first conversation I had with Julia Hartz, I pointed to people like MailChimp Presents and all these other people who are starting to do it. And she's like, yeah, I still don't understand why I should do that. And I'm glad she did, learning from failure, because it then made me have to figure out how to say the dark funnel is not as dark as we think it is. And to say the content that we produce for the dark funnel has value further down. Like if we're going to do a podcast that I can't equate to MQLs, great, but the material from that podcast is in an ebook that generated X millions of dollars. Like being able to say that then said, if you take that away, that content gets staled and competitors then take up the um, fill of the vacuum. And so I was, had the buy-in and I was starting to build the framework for taking our demand gen focused uh, content marketing and turning it into an in-house media company before the pandemic hit. I then started to, I got laid off, advised a bunch of companies, like some cool companies like Dovetails, one of the uh, ones that I worked with that just were so fun to work with because they didn't want the demand gen thing. Mm -hmm. They said, look, we have an opportunity to raise a, a shitload of awareness we just need to figure out how to do that with content. And I worked with them to develop a strategy to become the like proverbial water cooler for researchers to sort of share their war stories and their tips and tricks with one another. A um, bunch of other companies like uh, obviously AI, um, I'm trying to think of some other ones, but uh, eventually ended up at Udemy. Um, the long story short with Udemy was that it was a great opportunity. I loved working there, but it was not the right move for my career. Uh, what they were doing or wanted to do was focused primarily on like that older stuff that I had already done. So I started to look, I was about to accept one of two different offer, offers from other companies to leave you to me and go there when Hoppin reached out to me. And it is our now former CMO, uh, Anthony Canada, who reached out. I had known him from when he worked at Gainsight, who was CMO of Gainsight through Eventbrite. And we hopped on a call. I talked to him, talked to the VP of revenue, and who's now my boss, the VP of brand, uh, and basically heard what they wanted to do and said, all right, well, if that's what you want to do, I can do it. Uh, here's the resources I would need so forth. 
And it was like three phone calls. And I decided to go with Hoppin. And without going into too much details, it was building the foundation with a organic demand gen engine, Mm -hmm. but then building a in-house media company on top of it and Mm -hmm. doing it. So this is my contrary opinion. There are a lot of brands and CMOs out there that will say that their company is an in-house media company or their content team. And what they really mean is we do more than blog. Right. You have some courses and a podcast. And to me, like having actually worked in media, that's not how that's just that still feels like content marketing. It still it doesn't feel like I am a I'm not doing what the media world does to sort of focus on how do I cater to the, the, where does this piece of content fit into someone's day? So like, instead of just having an hour long podcast or multiple hours long, like what are, you know, is there a part of someone's life where there it's like the 15 minutes they have between like commuting or something like that? Like, is that where I fit in? Um, How do I, what are the like, ways I can hit multiple demographics with a, um, a franchise or a series that, and then how does that then turn into a franchise? How to like, when I look at Marvel and I see comic books, movies, TV shows, I mean, merchandise obviously, but I don't think we'll go there, but multiple different formats and how they all work together. I think if you've seen the Dr. Strange trailer, and you watch the what if cartoons from uh, Marvel, you'll have this oh shit moment where you thought the what if series was this like sort of like separate thing that now all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, you're going to have to watch that. Mm -hmm. And so thinking of like how all, all of it fits together and not just being able to say, I do more than blogging. What do you have examples of good media company or good in-house media companies? Um, I think I get your point on, you know, there, there's kind of modular components and like there's different, you know, 15 minute podcast here, multiple forms that you can hit multiple people with, but who, who's doing that well? In my best example, and I think is the most exemplary is profit. Well, mm, okay. And the reason I think, and in Wistia, um, and I think Wistia has an incentive because that it showcases like the best of the best of their product. Mm -hmm. Profit. Well, is an interesting example, considering their product isn't the media. It's not media. It's, and the different variety of shows that they have and how they target the different, not use. It's not all like business. It's got different forms of like, I think it's what like Jay Akunzo says, like each thing has a specific premise to it that, mm. you know, most podcasts or shows that people put on, I don't think an audience can turn to like, you know, a colleague or a friend and explain and describe the show in a succinct way. Like, Oh, it's a Q and a interview where these people talk to the professional and a month later, they might remember like the person they told might remember, oh, it's a Q&A with some professionals. But then when there's a sea of those things, it's like, it doesn't matter. And they might end up on the wrong one that they go find. Mm-hmm. But when with profit, well, like they are focused on the topics and giving the show a certain appeal. I've heard their, uh, their CEO and uh, Patrick, I'm blanking on his last name right now, but he's talked about how he doesn't just look at what competitors are doing, but he looks at all the other media that the audience is consuming and trying to figure out like, what are the schemas that I can borrow from those elements, what elements and stuff that I can help them say it's like this, but for that. Uh, So if like you're, you know, one of the ways I would approach a show is if I found out my audience loves game shows, great. Well, instead of doing an interview with like a professional, can I do a game show? Hmm. Another, you know, can I do, what can I, what can you learn from, um, I'm going to butcher it because I can't remember the name of it right now. What's the one with the hot sauce? Oh, uh, uh, hot, hot ones. One. Hot one. Yeah, like, I love that show. 
like if it if it just took a different angle where if it, it's a game show slash interview so it it's fresh it had you know it has what um Derek Thomas has written about in um, Hit Makers, where he says, like, you need something familiar and something new. Mm. And so something familiar being, and you could take two familiar things and turn, so, turn them into something new. And that's how creativity and art works, essentially. But uh, I think that's where you have the, this whole B2B marketers thinking like B2C marketers is coming from. And I think the the hot takes in that are sort of like sophomoric and I don't like to get into those like arguments of B2B, B2C. Wait, what is but, this argument? I'm, I'm not totally familiar uh, with that. Like, I, I keep seeing tweets about like how like B2B marketers don't have taste and oh. B2C marketers do and how like B2C marketers will make fun of B2B marketers for realizing that they're marketing the humans and not robots. <laughs> and it's true, but I think they lose sight of the fact that B2C marketing started with like, you know, uh, products and goods and stuff like, and people sitting with a, standing with a clipboard in the grocery store, watching people select toothpaste, Mm -hmm. like B2B marketers have never had to do that. And now it's so competitive. They have to, for the same reason that it's now the competition has gotten to that point. It used to be you only had IBM, but then all of a sudden you had IBM, Oracle, Salesforce. Now you have IBM, Oracle, Salesforce, HubSpot, and everyone else like who's in that game. And so look at Hopin. Hopin has a bunch of competitors. Look at any business and there's feature parity. There is like, it's so hard to differentiate yourself. And I think it's moving into this world where yes, B2B marketers have to accept or adapt to B2C type uh, marketing philosophies. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that it's, I think it's pointless to like point out that this is happening because it was just how it happened. It's like how long B2B has been around. It's pretty infantile compared to B2C. In terms it's of also marketing. an echo chamber in, in B2C too. Like you can look at all kinds of D2C startups and see the same copy, the same creative, the same ads. And like, maybe it looks savvier, but it's still not creative, so to speak, because they're still kind of copying each other in the same system. So I, I find like whether you're B2B or B2C or whatever, looking across all different spaces and trying to like, I guess like you kind of alluded to this, but that um, uh, creative synergy of taking something familiar and blending it with something unique. You know, so I'll take ideas from affiliate marketers for content marketing in specific. I'll take conversion rate ideas from, from B2C, you know, D2C startups. And it's like, how can I apply this in my context? I think once you kind of break those silos and labels down, it's like, you just kind of do what's best for your situation. Exactly. And that's why it's like, I think I try to preach a lot about the empathy for like how, so what is someone going through? Like, when I have my team do jobs to be done, I ask them to not stop at like, I need this to do that, to keep asking why after you do it. Mm-hmm. So uh, at Udemy was like, I'm learning this skill so I can get this job. Well, why do they want that job? What's the motivation? What is the emotional value of them getting that job? And if you tap into that, you tap into something that is even more universal, more human than just like, I need this information to do X, Y, Z. It's why do you need to do X, Y, and Z that matter? Mm -hmm. And that is where you get into, uh, when you tap into that, you then start to think of like those, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how other, not just marketing, but how anything taps into b2c film movies books any media news how like even like what is now considered news but infotainment like how are they triggering emotions and getting people to grow an audience uh you might understand that yeah there's some nefarious things that they're doing but then you learn from those nefarious things to figure out how to do things in a benevolent way so how are you approaching building that media machine at hopin 
Like, it sounds like you've thought a lot about how to stand out, how people do it the wrong way. Um, and I kind of get the demand gen side, but how are you focusing on building a differentiated media machine internally? So the first thing that I've had to do and has been, so we, I spent the first few months building the demand gen engine and that is, I don't want to say is perfection or a well-oiled machine yet, but is at least become a flywheel. And this is like SEO and complimentary offers on the page. Like if you go to the blog them. today, like that stuff. Mm -hmm. and how it ties to our demand gen efforts through like you'll see any like this week we published a ebook uh, guide on um event sponsorship and we did an event today on event sponsorship i don't do events that's the demand gen field marketing team and they what i've done is i got alignment with them where instead of them coming up with the event idea we plot together the the topics and when they're like that content will come out and how they can then leverage it. So, and the value of that content in the, the content led webinars and uh, virtual events that we're doing have so much more value in it because it, as you know, when you're doing research for a long form piece of content, there's even material that ends up on the cutting room floor that you can then share with them to like be this extra little piece that gets brought up. Mm -hmm. And you share that with like the sales team. So when they see that someone, yeah, someone read this piece of content, instead of talking to them about the creepiness of that content, you know, you can say, hey, if you're interested in this, here's another article like that's related to this or another thing that I, I've been thinking about, even though we're the ones who shared it with them, mm -hmm. said to share it. Um, but how I think about building a media company is first, and this is all the reason I can't say in concrete, like concretely is it's actually still in the works. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason it's still in the works and I didn't just like start launching things is efficiency. I am worried about not, I, at the end of the day, if, I mean, we talked about the recession of 2008, but there's been like what three recessions since then, like recessions down, like the economy is like a lot of ups and downs. I want to make sure that what we build has sustainability and that when it comes to that same idea of like, if you cut this, this other thing becomes stale. That is the thing that I can tie to revenue. And so I am working on first cross-functional alignment. So not just like within marketing, but within throughout the org and aligning everything we do to the company OKRs, even if it's a show. And always being able to articulate that because if I can articulate it, my CMO can articulate it to the CEO, can articulate it to our finance team, and everyone's a champion of what we're doing. That we're getting close to. Um, the other way I think about it is what are the resources we have? What can we build? So we, come, we have a laundry list of ideas of things we can do that go beyond just like podcasts and video series. Like, I even threw out the idea of a like word game with the popularity of Wordle. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we do that? And do we have the resources? Is it something we can do on a consistent basis? And then I then think of um, basically of those ideas, you got to know obviously what the premise is, but then what is the, um, what are the, what is the main source format of it? And then what are the ancillary formats of it to create a franchise? So I'm thinking of it as like even our SEO content, how can we package it up in a way that someone understands that this is like part of a bigger library. So mm -hmm. like, just like when you go to your public library, you go to the history section or the cooking section, like how can I like categorize and put all of our content into a certain like bucket that the customer or the customer of our content understands that this is part of a series. And if I like this, I can go deeper and subscribe to that. And then, so that's like the magazine world of it. If you think about that, like how magazines are run, but then the multimedia stuff is about the resources. How do we create a sustainable program instead of just saying, Oh, we're going to launch a podcast that's like once a week or whatever why not launch multiple limited like 
duration. So let's say a season is only six episodes, but it comes around once a year. All right, that's only six weeks. What do you do the other ones? And so it allows you to create multiple different franchises that have a cadence to it that then uh, people will anticipate and know when that next one's coming and you can start to like build that audience in that scarcity. Um, and then you just got to make sure that all of that feeds into things. So if I released this year's 2022 guide to event sponsorship, well, I definitely want to make sure that the media that we're publishing through between now and next year covers that topic. So when it comes time to refresh that piece of content, I have new material, new stories to inject into it and to atomize from it. And so thinking about it from that way, and as I said earlier, thinking about how it fits into the customer's like life and how that relates to the product. So how are we going to like, the phrase I use is from OPP to HPP. So other people's property. So how do we play there? And then how do we use that to get us to the hop and park uh, product portfolio? Mm -hmm. So thinking of it as a map and what are the and content as the breadcrumbs that go out to bring people in. So Rand Fishkin's idea of who will amplify this. So it's not just publishing on our own platform, but creating content in a way that can be chopped up. So it's easily distributed and shared, not just on our, like uh, our own channels, like social media and so forth, but other people's property. So like other, like experts who are in their field, the professionals, um, when you think of an enterprise strategy, right, uh, a content strategy, you don't want to just target the buyer. You want to target below and above the line. You want to like everyone who's involved in that decision, you want to influence so they can then influence the buyer decision. And so it's that same strategy, but on a much broader level where the people who you want to influence the people who won't might not buy the, the product, but when someone asks them for a recommendation, you're top of mind. Is that something that you um, tactically do as well as strategically? Because I get that you would do audience research or influencer research even for amp amplifying and you create content that you hope that they're going to share. They hope you know they're going to link to or something like that. But do you actually map out the people who you want to share those things or to link to those things or to do whatever with those things and like reach out to them and like engage them in any way like tactically or... How, how does that work like from the, the plan to the actual execution there? There's definitely a tactical aspect to it where, so I think it, the easiest way to wrap your head around it, anybody's head around it is to think of how do you tap into the subject matter experts who have an audience? Mm -hmm. And so instead of just like writing about them, how do you work with them to feature them and get like some of their newest insight? So if I were to say, like, I've always been a fan of uh, Dan and Chip Heath because Made to Stick is like a Bible to me. And if I wanted to do something about with them, instead of just doing my own thing where I regurgitate what I believe and understand about their material, why not tap them to provide insight into what they've learned since publishing that book? And that is a tactic where I know that I'll get fresh insight that no one can sort of replicate, but also too, they would have incentive to sort of help us promote it because it then helps them because people will go buy their book and so forth. I love that idea. It's a, uh, I used to do that with CXL called the editorial cabinet technique. And it was also to build and create good content, like, cause they're actual subject matter expert, experts, like you said, but like once you're in that piece, once you're a, a formative part of creating that, it's like you have some sort of embedded interest in sharing that and and you know exactly sharing it with the world the other so. way to do it too is with customers mm -hmm. customers have no incentive to share a case study hey everybody you want to see why i bought this piece of software <laughs> right. three months ago and haven't proved the roi on yet like because it's not what it doesn't say anything and so that's where this idea of like content where the customer is the hero sounds like a trope now that people are talking about it is so valuable because you know if i do it's this right it's doing an interview with someone 
where you find out like, what did they do? What is their, who are they? And like, what hard earned secrets can I extract from that person so that they can then feel validated back to the imposter syndrome thing too, and feel good about sharing that content because then it's a, you're basically borrowing their halo effect of their Mm. enthusiasm for being highlighted and in the spotlight. It's different when you go to highlight someone like, oh, I'm going to do an interview with Bill Gates. What, why would they share it? Right. I mean, Bill Gates, if he really, really enjoyed you talking to you, might be like, send one post. But then if you go to someone who is maybe for all intents and purposes, never going to be anywhere remotely famous as Bill Gates, but has respect within their industry and their audience. Mm-hmm. Um, another way to do it too is, I mean, I'm thinking about the books, but like, is there someone who's tapping into uh, a certain trend that you can talk to them about? So if I wanted to talk to say like a few years ago, Marie Kondo about like having everything and like that idea, like her philosophy, but how it applies to events. Mm -hmm. Like that would be, I mean, right now it's a little old. I wouldn't do it, but at the time, like that would have been an idea of figuring out who my audience is listening to and like has like lended some authority to and given them authority. And how do I use that as an advantage? Cause it's the same idea as like, commercials when they have spokesperson or uh, celebrity, you know, endorsements. It's that same idea, just in a different strategy. Yeah. I mean, you've definitely given me a million ideas about our podcast and our office hour sessions. So I'm excited because what you said resonated because we really do use these just to like pull interesting ideas from what people are working on and see if we can apply them. Um, and it's also a cool way, you know, through the podcast to bring people into our world too. Um, I think we can get more strategic about it. Like, like you were alluding to, um, do you want to do some rapid fire non content questions? I love this. I was just telling, uh, who was it? It was, uh, Oh, I started to watch, uh, the menu, Amanda Natividad's, uh, YouTube thing. And I told her, I was like, Oh, this is so awesome. Cause you taught the content people about non content things. And I said, I, I want more of that. So I feel like I can connect to someone not beyond like their job title. So that's the most fun it. part of the interview. And in, in some sense, like we all know how to create SEO driven content yeah. <laughs> at this point. So, but most people don't know what the most underrated aspect of New Orleans is. Long time ago, I would have said Frenchman Street, but that has become like not much of a secret anymore. That's the jazz uh, district or? Yeah. And yeah, I was, was like, over there too. I was like, that's, that's like the true essence of New Orleans. Um, oh man, there's a bar that I, so remember when you went and I said, oh, if you're going like, depending on who you're going with, I have like a different list. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. So if it's not the safest bar in the world, but it is the craziest bar I've been to in New Orleans where I used to think it was like, you had to be drunk enough for it to appear uh, <laughs> called uh, Snake and Jake's Christmas Club. Oh, wow. It is pitch black. There's probably lots of seedy things going on there, uh, but it's like the Mos Eisley of New Orleans. And I just feel like I have so many stories from that place. Um, the only other thing I think is like, I think a lot of people think of New Orleans as Mardi Gras. Mm-hmm. I tell people if it's your first time going to New Orleans, go for Jazz Fest. Yeah. Jazz Fest is probably the best time to be in New Orleans because all those artists who are playing on stage, they are bringing some friends with them and they're going to do some surprise shows somewhere in the city. And so you'll stumble upon all kinds of different people uh, just playing at a random bar that you would have to go pay $200 to go see live. I love that. Did you also tell me about the alligator cheesecake or... I feel like a few people told me about that. I probably didn't because I tend to not care about cheesecake. Mm. I, I'm one of those weird people, but alligator is definitely something I'd recommend someone trying at least once because it's, you don't get it everywhere. And it, the way it's, it's pretty good in places. Yeah. Mm. Really good. Especially if it's cooked well. Yeah. Um, 
on the converse, what is the most overrated tourist trap of New Orleans? I am so Bourbon Street. I I'm actually not going to throw under the bus because I believe it it is now that I've seen things like Fisherman's Wharf here in uh, San Francisco and been to Vegas, there's still a lot of on authenticity for Bourbon Street. The, it's got a and, time and a place too. It's not yeah. like you'd want to go all the time, but like it's fun fun when you do it. I'd say the tourist trap is probably Cafe Dumont. Oh, interesting. So Cafe Dumont is interesting. I think it's one of those, it's like the, uh, not Eiffel, uh, the Empire State Building, like do it once, sure. Mm -hmm. But after that, like, or if you go down, like go during like a, a downtime where it's not so busy, sure, like for the ambiance. But other than that, it's just powdered donuts, man. It's not mm -hmm. that big of a deal. Like there's actually a place here in San Francisco that I think has, perfectly better beignets so i could see that i could see yeah, that i went there it was the fun but yeah all. i also can't eat that many powdered donuts you know, like yeah. <laughs> it's like how how many days in a row could you do that before you just feel awful you know yeah <laughs> the only other thing i'd say is like the swamp tours are hit or miss but those aren't in new orleans you have to like oh, travel. i out. did one of those we kayaked the swamp and uh it was pretty cool like, yeah. I guess we got a day where there was a lot of alligators out. So I think, like you yeah. said, hit or miss. And I think that was special. But we saw like, like 20 alligators, I, I, oh, something like that. It was a lot. That's impressive. Yeah. Actually, more than I've ever seen in any of those trips. And I used to go film commercials for them for a local station. And a water moccasin, too. I got caught Ooh. on a log, like 10 feet away from a water moccasin. <laughs> it's like trying to uh, wiggle my way off without waking the thing up. It was terrifying. No, dude, those things are, I have like a, deep fear because of something that happened when I was a little kid where I like was playing and came face to face with one. And luckily my grandpa was there with like a, a 22 and shot its head off. But like, yeah, those it was one of those things where I was a little kid and like, just you saying water moccasin made me like a little like <laughs> clammy. Absolutely terrifying. Yeah. yeah. But made it out. Okay. Um, who do you admire professionally and why? <sighs> so many people. I'm going to need some time to think of this one. So let's see. And I might say someone and then think of someone else. Um, oh. I'm literally thinking of so many different people. And I, as soon as I think of one person, I think of the next, because there's just been so many people who have like, influence my career whether they i directly or indirectly you know like i've only known people like you know amanda natividad for a short while and i we've only had a few like one-on-one -on -one conversations but i deeply admire what she's able to do and how she just brings such a positive radiance to like everything she does mm -hmm. um I don't want to butcher her last name, but uh, Christina, uh, head of uh, community over at uh, HubSpot, like how she has the energy to just interact and ha with like that many people at that level all the time. I admire there are people I work with uh, today that I admire. Um, so um, I'm going to butcher his last name. So it's uh, Manuel Reich. Uh, has been my boss up until recently. Um, and I've just admired working for him, for Anthony Canada. Um, and then the people I, you know, actually, if there's one person I have to say, it's Margaret Jones. Mm -hmm. If I do have to say it's one person, because I learned a lot from Margaret before I worked for her. And then when I did work for her, I was probably like, I'm sure she probably wished she had someone who was more senior and more like ahead in their career at the time, but not a day goes by that I don't like feel grateful for how much she believed in me and how much she like, how much work she put into me to be who I am today. Like I've learned so much from her and just 
forever will feel like in debt unless I somehow I'm able to pull it, pay it forward in at the level that she did for me. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, when you get somebody who takes a bet on you and, and pushes you farther than you would have gone alone, you got to be grateful for that for sure. If you could create your own category in Jeopardy, what would it be? And would you get every question right? I feel like I know a lot about music, but then I meet people who know infinitely more. Like I don't know <laughs> a drummer of certain bands, but there are people who like know all of the drummers that have been for a certain band. Uh, so I don't like to say that, but it would have to relate to music in popular music in movies. So like mm. not soundtracks, but like, or uh, scores, but like what were like, you know, this song was in this movie and I would be able to guess the movie probably. Yeah. I don't think I've told many people this, but that's one of my dream jobs that I've always wanted is to be, I don't even know what the position is, but the person who picks the music for movies. Like that's one thing I notice all the time, uh, especially like Tarantino films. Mm -hmm. I think he does a great juxtaposition of like very happy music with very fucked up scenes or like 500 days of summer had the perfect soundtrack. You know, like I I very keenly am aware of like why this song is plays at this time and like what emotion it's provoking. So like that, that would be a dream job for me. And I think that's the reason I even thought of that is the same reason that I like how I would put together sets for DJing. Like if I was doing a house set or a, even a trance set, like there was just this like story in my head and it was this movie and this was the song that plays during that scene kind of thing. So I've just always been keenly aware of like how music is used in a certain way to, in film and in video. That's cool. Um, what talent would you most like to have? Mm. Honestly, painting Painting. i can draw but i'm always wanted to be at like i have taste when it comes to color and like the way color is used but i'm not able to do what designers and painters and other people are able to do with color and it feels like i have this color blindness not being able to express myself that way yeah, I have, a, I think, a block entirely in visual creativity, like any sort of drawing or painting or anything like that. But I, I've actually resigned myself to that. And I'm like, all right, this is going to be the one thing that I don't understand from a craftsman perspective that I just fully appreciate from an ignorance perspective. Because yeah. I, I still love going to museums and like I love art. But when I try to draw even like something basic, like I can't even do wireframes beyond, you know, back of the napkin, like balsamic kind of things. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like, that. that's one of those things where I disrespect the skill level and I'm like, not going to get there. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you consider the most overrated virtue? I'm trying to think of the right word for it. Um, giving respect to people who like, because of their status like reverence like you know the whole idea of respect your elders respect like like i don't know as i've gotten older i realized like those things aren't what deserve respect like as I get older, I still want people to like question why I deserve respect. So I'm on my toes and don't think it just because I'm old, I should be respected. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel so like it's something like you earn. Yeah. Lonely and a bit patronizing to always be respected because you're this age or this, this job role or something like that. Yeah. Like I will always respect people who I don't know anything about, but the idea that I should respect someone based on something that doesn't make sense to me like that, like some status of their in society has always been like, I think the source of a lot of my rebellious attitude. Yeah. Definitely resonate with that. Um, What blogs, podcasts, and influencers are you loving to follow nowadays? Hmm. So I recently became a uh, subscriber to every 
and the quality of the content on there. It's like multiple newsletters. Uh, it's every dot two. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there, that's like been a source of a lot for me. Influencers. It's hard to influence me <laughs> as a marketer. Uh, I've been, I don't know what to find. It's hard to define an influencer to me because like, I'm thinking of, I'm going back to the like reasons why I said who I respected. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So with that one, uh, since I ended up going with Margaret, I'm going to go with Amanda Natividad, who probably wouldn't say she's an influencer, but she's definitely like helped me like see how to be a, a positive professional and I think that's had a lot of influence on me and how I approach things. Um, I believe another person is uh, Zoe Scammon from, I uh, hope I don't get her agency wrong, but Aceous. she's just such an expert in this whole like Web3 space that mm. has so much noise and so much proneness to it that turns me off. And when I first started reading her stuff on fandom and creator, the creator economy, I was like, she's on to something here that I've seen, but not been able to articulate. So I would say those two, and I feel like there's someone else in there, but those are the two people that come top of mind. And then in terms of other like blogs, not necessarily. And then podcasts, I'm always a fan of freaking economics um jay akunzo i love his stuff on resonance has been really amazing and speaking to me and then um oh uh alexis gaze uh non-technical once again because it's about talking to professionals without talking about their profession i love that i'll have to check that out i've, I've seen her um like videos I, I think on twitter i don't know mm -hmm. if they're like tiktoks that are repurposed or whatever but like the shit Literally. san francisco people say and stuff like yeah. that yeah so i'll check that out oh that's a good answer uh, i always love hearing new ones um so that's super cool and then uh easy last one which is where where do you want to point people to find you online twitter so at ronnie higgins uh i feel bad for people who follow me on linkedin because nothing against linkedin but it just doesn't cater to me. They might, like I ended up turning off notifications because I get notifications of people posting pictures of their kids. I got lots of reactions and I'm like, great. Uh, didn't need to see that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> LinkedIn's a weird place. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Yeah. It's one of the things where I'm like proud of people like Devin Reed who have really honed in and nailed like LinkedIn Mm -hmm. uh and i'm sure he's probably got thoughts on how i can better use it and not hate it so much that i probably need to get from him but um yeah it's just twitter is the easiest place to get me my dms are open there if you ever want to hit me up uh because i tend to not just just broadcast my thoughts on marketing and advertising and business to the world but if you have a question it tends to be easier for me to get, you know, to extract my thoughts and knowledge on things. Oh yeah. Well, Ronnie, thank you so much. This was super fun. Uh, dude. And next time you go to New Orleans, maybe uh, we can sync up. I'll be there at the same time. There Trade will be around. a next time. I definitely got to get back there and vi uh, vice versa with you in Austin. Sweet. All right, man. Well, this was awesome. Thank you.